starting now. And I will share my screen and then we're off. So, um, yeah, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us who you are, where you're from, and why you're interested in thermal imaging, if you feel like it. Um, I will um, be taking questions at the end, uh, but if you do want to pop a question in the chat, then please do so, and I will have a look at the chat every few minutes uh, to check on the questions. Um, first of all, uh, I need to tell you that I need to admit some people. Um, I'm, I'm going to make Claire a co host. So uh, Claire, you can admit any latecomers. So um, the first thing is that this webinar is part of Community Energy Fortnight, um, which is an annual celebration of all things to do with community energy that is held by Community Energy England every year. Um, and the theme of energy uh, of Community Energy Fortnight this year is efficiency first, um, because as we all know, the most sustainable energy is the energy that you do not use, um, and therefore the focus is on energy efficiency. Um, the two logos you can see in the middle are Dark Matter Labs and Civic Square. Um, more about those in a minute, but they are basically paying for my time to be here tonight. So this is what I'm going to cover this evening. Uh, Community Energy Fortnight. Uh, the Link Road Neighbourhood Retrofit Project from which the idea of this webinar emerged. Um, a little bit about understanding building energy performance, which I appreciate might be um, a revision for, for a lot of you, and some of you will know possibly even more than I do about it. Um, and then um, look, we'll be looking at some thermal images uh, and what they tell us. Um, and then we'll be going through how to use a thermal imaging, a thermal imaging camera and software and, and how to report on thermal imaging. Uh, so this is a little bit a bit a little bit about me. Um, I help you to develop decarbonisation strategies, implement them, and prove success. Um, mostly working with small businesses, co-ops, non-profits, faith groups, householders, and public bodies. Um, I'm mostly helping people who aren't sure where to begin or aren't sure what to do next. Uh, and I do this through environmental and energy performance audits, strategy formulation, training and mentoring, helping you to make the business case for environmental action and bid writing. Um, so Community Energy Fortnight, as I said, is uh, an, annual, um, an annual event that Community Energy England holds. Um, and the aims of it this year to inspire people to get involved in community energy projects, to set up new community energy projects, to take personal actions and to encourage our MPs to become uh, champions for community energy and for policy, policy change at the end. Um, and yes, the slides will be available at the end uh, and more to, the, more to the point, there will be a recording which will be on YouTube uh, and on uh, my website, energyconfidence.co.uk. Um, so um, a little bit about the Link Road neighbourhood retrofit. Link Road is a road in, um, in the Summerfield area of Northwest Birmingham. Um, which is quite a lively community. Um, I'm, you know, every time I go there, it, it feels really nice there. Um, and a local organisation, um, Civic Square, um, have got together with Dark Matter Labs, who are a design consultancy, um, and they've come up with the idea of a neighbourhood retrofit. Um, but it's not just any sort of community project. It's based upon the ideas of donut economics, and it's attempting to 
to make the connections between everyday actions and a just um, transition to a low carbon economy. Um, and so in the picture, what you can see is an event uh, held by um, Civic Square, um, at which local people, including you know, babes in arms and everybody, um, are talking about don donut economics and, and what it means and concepts such as the ecological ceiling um, and, and what they mean uh, um, and what that means in terms of uh, local projects such as neighborhood retrofit. Um, and they, that, that, there you can see Amy Core, who is the founder of Civic Square and whose idea this all was. Um, and I've been working with Civic Square and Dark Matter Labs on this, um, helping the residents to understand um, the energy performance of their homes and what could be done with them. Project on my website, energyconfidence.com. There is an echo, isn't there? Um, okay, I, I think most of you have got your um, microphones on mute, um, which is great. But anybody who hasn't got the microphone on mute, please put it on mute now and hopefully it'll keep the echo and feedback to a minimum. Um, so before we look at thermal images, I think it's worth understanding um, the energy performance of the homes that we typically live in and where the greenhouse gas emissions come from. Um, and so this is, um, and so in most homes, around 80% of greenhouse gas emissions come from heat. Um, and Somebody muted me. <laughs> right, okay. So um, it's important to understand how heat is lost from our homes. Um, and um, so we're going to look at three three archetypes. Um, this is a, a semi-detached house. Um, and as you can see, most heat is lost through the walls. Um, a lot of heat is lost through cold air infiltration, which is leakiness, um, windows, um, floor, um, uh, doors, roof. Less and less is lost through the roof because most people have got some insulation in the roof. And um, you've also got um, thermal bridging, um, which is where uh, building elements meet um, and where the difference in thermal conductivity enables heat to escape. Um, so that's um, a, semi, a typical semi-detached. Sorry, you can hear the ice cream van open, going past because the window's open. Um, so next is a three-story uh, mid-terrace townhouse. Uh, the houses in Link Road are mostly three-storey mid-terraces. Um, and again, most of the heat loss is through the walls, um, some is through the floor, a lot is through cold air infiltration, which is general leakiness, especially where there's pipes, cables, um, and um, services going in and out of the building. Um, and My cursor has disappeared. So, okay. I'm gonna start sharing again because it's gone out of presenter mode. Sorry, a little technical difficulty here. Just bear with me a minute while I get the presentation up again.
Okay, while we're waiting for that to load, I'm going to show you two bits of kit. Um, so this is the first one, and this is a FLIR uh, thermal imaging camera that you plug into a mobile phone. Um, so when I first used a thermal imaging camera, it was a big, massive thing that came in a like a suitcase, um, a briefcase, and um, you had to insure it and everything. Um, and it was a bit of a nuisance. And then um, a couple of years ago, FLIR started doing a, a camera that plugs into a mobile phone. So this is the actual camera that, that I use and a lot of other people use. Um, and th this is an Android one. You can also get a, um, a, a um, iPhone one. Um, and it, it simply plugs into the bottom of your phone um, and you upload, there is an app um, that comes with FLIR, which you upload to the phone. Um, and um, I will show you that now. Um, so this is the FLIR app. You can see on the phone now. I will show you this later when the um, when everything's working again properly. Um, so, um, even that isn't working. <laughs> Right. Okay. So uh, the other piece of kit that I'm going to show, and the, um, the the camera comes with um, a, a charging cable, and you can just plug it into a, a USB charger. The other piece of kit that I'm going to show you is an infrared thermometer, um, and this is like the infrared thermometer that they point at your head when you are uh, when they want to test whether you've got a temperature, and that is you, and that doesn't record an image like a thermal imaging camera. What it does is it does an instantaneous temperature um and so if i point it at my external wall it's 26.9 degrees which is not surprising because it's actually hot um whereas if i did that in the middle of winter it might be about 18 degrees on that external wall um so um i've now got the slides back again so let's go back to the slides Um, so the third uh, type of house that we're going to look at is a, um, a detached bungalow. Um, and in a bungalow, uh, again, most of the heat loss is through the walls. Um, a lot is through the floor in a bungalow. Um, and again, you've got cold air infiltration, um, windows, um, because the ratio of, surface, of, walls, of uh, windows to walls is, is quite high. Um, and so that's where heat is typically lost. Um, from different types of home. And obviously you could do this with every archetype. You could do it with flats. You could do it with high rise. You could do it with low rise. Um, but th they're the, some of the most typical types of home that we get, especially in the Midlands. Um, so um, in addition to external heat loss through the walls, the floor, um, thermal bridging, um, cold air infiltration and so on, um, heat is also lost from a home internally. Um, so, um, so one of the ways this, this is lost is through pipe work from the boiler to the radiators um, not being insulated. So in most homes, uh, there will be there will be some pipe work that is, un that is uninsulated, and particularly if there is a suspended timber floor on the ground floor under the suspended timber floor, there will be hot water pipe work. And typically that will be uninsulated. Um, and there's quite a lot of heat loss through that. And we'll see some images of that in a bit. Um, where there is a hot water cylinder, and obviously a lot of people nowadays have got uh, combination boilers and don't have a cylinder. But for people that do have a hot water cylinder, um, 
either on a boiler or a heat pump, um, if there is uh, pipe work and valves between the hot water cylinders and the tap that is uninsulated, then you will again get um, you will again get heat loss through there. Um, and uh, this is particularly a, the larger the building, the, the longer the potential pipe work distances are, especially in non-domestic uh, buildings. You can get quite a distance between the boiler and the taps, um, and and a lot of heat loss through there. Right, the presentation's crashed again. So um, I'm going to go for plan B. So in a minute, I'm going to be showing you some, uh, quite a lot, a few thermal images of, of some of the things that we've talked about. Um, it's important to remember that when you see um, the websites of thermal imaging camera companies, thermal imaging software companies, um, people whose full-time job it is to do thermal imaging, then what you will see is images that have had quite a lot of uh, done to them uh, with sometimes quite expensive um, software. And um, some of these images, some of these thermal images that you will see it on these websites look quite glamorous. Um, and in real life, thermal images are not always that glamorous. Uh, one of the problems with thermal imaging is the, the, the images that you will see on uh, manufacturers' websites are taken from perfect angles. Um, when you're actually doing thermal imaging um, in tight spaces, you know, in, uh, at the, in the entry at the side of a house, in the cellar of, or the loft space of the house, then the angles are not all that brilliant. And so the thermal images aren't that aren't that sexy. So bear in mind that some of the images you will see are quite grainy and a bit um, and not very exciting, uh, but they do nevertheless re reveal a lot. Um, and um, as you'll see in a minute when I get the presentation to work again. Um, so. Um, Um, there's a question from Ken. How much does it cost? Ken, are you talking about a camera or a person to use it? Camera. Okay. Um, this costs just over £400. Um, there is FLIR do two models of um, mobile phone camera, um, of which is one is slightly more expensive. Um, and um, yeah, this one is slightly more expensive. The other one is, is, is slightly cheaper. It's 300 and something pound, uh, but the images aren't as good. Um, if you, and, and this is suitable if, if you're if you're not doing thermal imaging all day, every day, then I think one of these is adequate. Um, if you were doing thermal imaging all day, every day, then you would uh, buy one of the big cameras that goes in a, a, a briefcase that costs several thousand pounds. You can also hire thermal imaging cameras. The, the bigger ones, you can hire them. There is a company in uh, Basingstoke that that does it, uh, if anybody wants the name, then I, I can let you have their name. Um, but um, the other thing is that Octopus Energy loan um, thermal imaging cameras to, to their customers, although there is a massive waiting list. But yeah, so Octopus Energy loan them to their customers and apparently none of them have ever been stolen. You know, you, you're given it for a, a week and you're given an envelope to return it in and apparently none of them have ever been stolen. Um, so um, so it depends on the scale. Um, uh, the other thing is that, you know, communities can share them. Uh, Peter Musgrave, I know that uh, down in Ilford, you've got a, a thermal imaging camera, which is 
available for community use. Um, the Link Road project and in uh, Ladywood has got has got several cameras for community use, um, and therefore um, a community approach to ownership and of a um, um, a thermal imaging camera is is a good idea. Right. Good news is that I think the presentation is now working. Um, so I will share again and resume. Um, first thing is about how to use a thermal imaging camera. And it's very important that you think about your own health and safety and those around you. Bear in mind that you might be doing, you will, you might well be doing thermal imaging in the dark. You might be doing it in a back garden. I myself have on a number of occasions, almost fallen in garden ponds and stuff. So be very careful. Um, don't take risks, uh, be aware of your surroundings. Um, a thermal imaging camera should ideally be used after dusk. Um, if you use it during daylight, then you will get false results. Um, so it is best to use it after dusk for two reasons. One, the heating is more likely to be on and therefore the, the building is, is losing heat. Um, and, and therefore the temperature differential between inside and outside will be greater. Um, also after dusk, then solar gain has finished um and 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 therefore you're not getting um and therefore it's at the best time to do it um it's best to do it when there's no precipitation of any kind rain or snow because even the tiniest speck of rain on the the lens will will just ruin the images um and so you know what i say to clients is i do say if i check the weather forecast and i say i email them on the morning and say look it looks like it's going to rain We'll keep an eye on the weather forecasts and but if necessary we'll postpone um, and you should ensure there's no people or animals in the picture uh, we'll see one uh, like the cats in the first picture who is basically asleep behind me and um the, it, because if there's a cat or a dog or a human in the picture then they will be the warmest thing in the picture and they'll give you a false result you want the building to be the warmest thing in the picture so you can pick up the heat loss um, and so what we're looking out for is building fabric, walls, floors, roofs, windows, doors, and also chimneys. Uh, we're looking for thermal bridging where building components meet. We're looking for cold air infiltration where cold air can get in and warm air can escape. We're looking for per perimeters, edges, and assemblies. Um, a lot of heat loss goes on at perimeters, edges, and assemblies, as we will see. Uh, we're also looking for ventilation losses. Um, and again, we'll see some of that. Um, and internally, we're looking for heat losses through distribution pipe work. So here are some thermal images at last. And again, these are not glamorous ones. Um, we'll see some more glamorous ones later. But um, so this is quite a large house. And the first thing you'll notice is that um, some of the windows have got quite a lot of heat loss. So this has a, sc a temperature scale on it. And so it, if it, and it's sort of, um, you know, yellow, red, orange is, uh, is, is warmer uh, and blue and purple is, is, is colder. Um, so what you will see is that, that there is a lot of heat loss through the windows. There is also a lot of heat loss through the walls. And although it, the, the external temperature of the walls is not as high as the external temperature of the windows, what you've got to bear in mind is that the surface area of the walls is much greater than the surface area of the windows. Um, and therefore the amount of heat being lost through the walls of this house is greater than the wall, the, the amount of lo being lost through the windows. Um, the other thing you'll see from this is that the, all of the roof spaces are, uh, there is less heat loss through the roof spaces than through the walls which reflects the fact that there is quite a bit of insulation in the in the loft, all the, all the loft spaces of this particular house. You'll also notice there's a lot of heat loss through the chimney. Now, there was not a, a fire in use in this house, not a gas fire, not a wood burning stove. There is no fire in use. That heat loss is because the chimney is open 
and therefore he is escaping from the living room up the chimney um and the fact that the chimney is glowing is a reflection of escaping uh, just escaping warm air um not because there's a fire on um the other thing you'll notice is is here where the the roof meets the wall and there is quite a glow there and that suggests that the air tightness is not very good there so in in i mean this house i think was built in the night yeah it was built in the 1920s um and in older buildings um certainly you know 1920s and before um you will often find that the seal between the roof and the walls is not particularly airtight um I've been in houses where you can you can physically see through there is you know there is a physical gap and you can see daylight um, and on a thermal imaging camera it shows up like that. Um, this house again um, there's a lot of heat loss uh, through in this house there is uh, visibly a lot of heat loss through the walls. Um, you will see that there is less heat loss through these windows and you've got to be careful with windows because of reflection um and and lighting but this suggests to me that because there is heat it clearly escaping through the the walls there is less heat escaping through the windows and that suggests to me that the windows are performing quite well um they're reasonably modern uh windows and and well installed windows as well because a badly installed window you will see you will see heat escaping um the fact that there's no heat escaping from either the glass or the the frames or the the seal between the frames and the wall these are the places where heat tends to show up on a badly installed window um that suggests to me that the windows are performing quite well um this window is performing less well which suggests it might not be as uh, to the same standard as as this um You'll also notice it, that the the again there is less heat loss through the roof than through the walls. Um, there is no evidence of air of of warm air escaping through the seal between the roof and the um, the wall. So that appears to be airtight. And again, you will see heat loss through the chimney. Um, and this one on the right again, you've got a lot of heat loss through the the walls, less through the windows, uh, less through the roof. Um, and this at the front is a conservatory and the, the conservatory roof is not losing heat. It's a, it, it's a, a heated conservatory. There are radiators in it, but I know you're not supposed to have radiators in a conservatory, but it's, it's arg debatable whether it's a conservatory or an extension. Let's call it an extension. There is less heat loss through the roof and a bit through the walls and the windows. And again, a lot of heat loss through the chimney. Um, um some of you might start to recognize your your homes now so um i'm not going to give any clues uh, but this is quite an interesting one uh, this is um edwardian detached house and you've got quite a bit of heat loss through the walls this is a, an unheated conservatory hence there is little heat loss from it um and um you'll again notice that there is heat loss here where the roof meets the walls um and again that might be evidence of lack of air tightness um incidentally uh, you've got a lot of heat loss so we talked about edges perimeters and corners and sometimes and corners corners are, are, are a place where heat will escape and so it's not surprising to see that I think in the case of this window, I think the I think it was open and that's why it's glowing there. But that's quite interesting because there isn't a lot of heat loss through the pane. Um, so the pane is performing very well. Um, and whereas the um, because that window has been left open, then the, there's some heat loss. Um, this one in the middle. Now, this is very interesting because obviously you've got heat loss through the um, the walls. Um, and again, in in this house i can tell you that you can see a gap if you're inside the loft you can see a gap between the roof and the top of the walls and so it's not surprising that heat is escaping there you've also got heat escaping from the chimney and here the, the chimney is on the outside um, and you can see hot spots there um this house on the right um this it, uh, most of the houses you'll see in these images have solid brick walls because uh, you know they're pre pre-first world war 
um, and that reflects the kind of people that, that I help, uh, householders at least. This house is slightly different. It was built in the 1960s. Um, it has cavity walls. Um, and you'll notice that, that there is, it, it's got cavity walls and not only has it got cavity walls, it's got insulated cavity walls. And at some point, somebody has insulated this with a, a bead insulation. Um, and what you will see is that there is still heat loss. And, and, and what that probably represents is that the insulation is uneven because it is, diff, you know, it, it's not always possible to do complete insulation in a cavity wall because there will be, you know, there will be rubble and debris, um, particularly if it's a 1930s house and, and it's been around for a while. Um, and, and sometimes people, especially on free government schemes, will come along and and do half a job on cavity wall insulation and they won't and, and there are some bits um around doorways and stuff where it's physically difficult to get the insulation in so it's it's perhaps not surprising that the, the walls are a bit uneven in terms of heat loss and this household actually had a heat pump installed um just over a year ago in fact yeah 18 months ago they, it was january 21 they had it installed um, and the heat pump is performing almost as well as it was predicted so um, we we did some predictions on the heat pump as to how much electricity it would use how much carbon it would save compared to the old lpg boiler and how much um, um, how much uh, it would the running costs would be in comparison to the gas boiler and the uh, and the performance of it is 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 marginally worse than we predicted when i say marginally you know it's a few quid a year it's not disastrous but I, and and they said to me why is it underperforming and the most likely reason is that the cavity wall insulation is not performing as well as expected the other thing you'll notice on this house is uh, the windows and that window is actually closed or th th there are no open windows there and, the, and so th there is uneven performance of that window and what that suggests is that the the the, um, the the windows are not are not sealed properly or are not closing properly and so what the client did is they got their window installer out because uh, it was under a guarantee and the window installer did what they were supposed to do they came out and they fixed it and the I haven't done thermal imaging since, but the, the household told me that the windows felt a lot warmer. Um, this, again, this is uh, a, an Edwardian house and you can see, um, obviously the walls are losing heat, particularly from the gable end. Um, often you'll find in detached houses, uh, the gable end uh, has the highest heat loss, but again, you've got heat loss where the roof meets the walls. Um, that one we've seen. Um, this is interesting because here you've got a let again heat loss through the walls, less heat loss through the roof. Those windows appear to be forming quite well, but you'll notice that there is the um, these are plastic, but the heat loss through the plastic is higher than through the the glass. Um, and so it's important that when we talk about windows, a window is not just a window; it is a system. And there are many, there are a number of components to it. And if you, you know, the, are any architects among you will be able to name all the different bits of a window. Um, but all the different bits of a window have may have slightly different thermal properties. And so you 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 get something like this where the panes are performing okay, but there is still heat loss there. And that's to do with design and materials used. And so what I say to people is, you know, there is no double glazing or windows. Not all windows are the same. Um, and if you're specifying windows, either for your own home or, or particularly for a community project or a, a housing project, then you should be you should be specifying windows by U value the way, you know, so if you had insulation done, you know, if you had external wall insulation to this house, then you your insulation contractor might reason, would say to you the final U value of, of, of this will be three will be 0 0.3 or 0 0.28 because that's what it's meant to be. Um, but people will come along and install windows and won't really tell you what the thermal performance of them is going to be. And I think people need to get into the habit of saying to window installers, 
I this is the thermal performance that I want. Um, and so I've got a client at the moment in Mosley who uh, I said to him, you should aim for a U value of between 0.8 and 1.2. Um, and uh, which, you know, I benchmarked against the what is on the market. And his window installer has come back to him and offered him a U value of um, 1.3, I think it is, which I think is OK. I mean, it, you know, and I, I again, I had a client in South Wales who was having windows done um, and um, I, I said to the installer, and this was a normal double glazing installer, it, it, tri double, triple, it wasn't a specialist. That they weren't doing passive house. This was a normal glazing company that do mass market stuff. And I said, we want a U value of 0 0.8 and the client was prepared to pay any extra. And the, the, the contractor said, yeah, we can do that, no problem. So you can't and should specify windows by U value. Right. OK, um, so this again is the house with um, underperforming cavity wall insulation. Um, you'll notice on this image that that, that window um, has changed slightly and that probably reflects the a fluctuation in external temperature because, yeah, uh, that night it was the temperature was going up and down. So um, and so, yeah, that's the same window, but slightly different, you know, because the the maybe the temperature had gone up or down a little bit. Um, interestingly, on this house, you can see they've got this porch. This is the back of the house. They've got this porch at the back. Um, the porch is unheated, but there is still a lot of heat escaping through the external wall of the porch. Um, and it's it's presumably been transferred from inside the house through where the the, the walls meet, um, or through or through the the, the internal door um but yeah um and so sometimes a porch can be the sort can, can, can contribute to the heat loss now this is an interesting one now this house it, it is a it is in a, a quite fashionable area of birmingham where uh and he's a conversion from a former um jewelry premises which is a bit of a giveaway as to where it is um and so yeah this used to be a jewelry premises and what happened is about five years ago a private developer came along and converted these into townhouses um a, you know three-story townhouses they're actually quite nice um and they have work live arrangement and so there's a an office as um as well as uh, it being a sort of two bedroom uh, three bedroomed house um at, and no, 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 no. Sorry, I'm completely wrong. Ignore what I've just said. Right now, this house is a 1965 Bryant home. So this was built in 1965 during a period where traditional construction materials and labour were in short supply. And therefore, building companies innovated uh, by using non-traditional materials to build houses, um, such as plastic and asbestos and all kinds of things. Um, and so we call this non-traditional construction, sometimes described as system built. Um, and so basically you've got walls which are not built of brick or, or breeze block or any recognisable form of masonry. Um, and they're built of various bits of plastic and asbestos. Um, and um, the energy performance certificates really struggle with these because, you know, you, you and so if, if you see an energy performance certificate for one of these homes, it's a bit of a lottery as to what it says um, for reasons which I won't go into. But this causes confusion among people uh, because sometimes you get houses built in the 60s, which are part brick and part non-traditional. Um, but this house uh, in this house, you can see you've got three distinct areas of, of wall on the first floor. Um, and you can see the heat loss through this one is, is fairly catastrophic. So the, the, again, the glass is performing okay, but that window is not airtight and heat is escaping um, at various points. And, and also at the junction between the frame and the, um, and the wall. Um, but the heat loss through there is, is obviously catastrophic and it feels cold if you pointed the, um, um, the infrared thermometer at that um, bit, bit of wall on the inside, then the temperature the temperature was much lower. It was the coldest part of the house. Now this bit 
again you've got a problem with the windows and you've got a problem here where the um the, the building components meet um but this area here there is less heat loss and that is because somebody's put insulation in there this concerned me slightly because I, I i i wasn't sure how they had dealt with moisture control because as we always say build tight ventilate right no insulation without ventilation and i wasn't happy that how moisture would behave in that um given that it's basically made of plastic and, and there is very little research on it if anybody knows of any because if you read case studies of retrofit on websites like the AECB and uh, the low energy buildings database, it's nearly all traditional construction housing made of brick and, 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 and other masonry materials. You don't see many case studies. And, and I, I'm not aware of anybody having uh, done any research into, into moisture performance in non-traditional homes. And if anybody knows any, then please let me know, because I think we need to learn from it. Um, and because the because this house is in a conservation area, believe it or not, um, because it's in a conservation area, you can't do external wall insulation because conventionally people do put external wall insulation on on these, uh, but you can't do this in this house because it's in conservation area. Fortunately, um, there were a lot of other quite easy measures to do in this house to do with the wall, um, the uh, roof the floor um, and and the heating system um, and also insulation of, of pipe work that you know the, the the householder was able to do quite a lot with it but not not to the walls because i did not feel comfortable advising him to put in any more in, insulation to the wall um i think we may have seen this one before um but again a lot of heat loss through the wall um windows variable this one's doing okay um and, and this one again a lot of heat loss through the chimney and uh, and that's another chimney on the other side of the um, the apex now this is very interesting because this is um a 1970s house um it's got cavity insulated cavity walls but on the side of the house it's a it's a detached house on the side of the house is a chimney and you'll it's it was quite common in the 60s 50s 60s and 70s so in in this older house the you know the chimney is not on the side of the house in the 50s 60s and 70s a lot of architects seem to put chimneys on the outside of um of quite nice and modern semi-detached and detached houses. And so what you can see here, this house has got a wood-burning stove and the, the, the wood-burning stove was on, on the night that I did the thermal imaging. Uh, and you can see the heat escaping. This is where the wood-burning stove is because this brick here, it's literally one layer of brick. Um, and so you can see the heat there where the, the appliance is and you can see the heat rising up the ceiling, up, up the chimney and coming out of the sides as well um and you know that's enormously wasteful and and because it's single brick then even if they didn't have the fire on let's say they had yeah you know, that evening they had the fire on but not the central heating let's say they did it the other way around if they had the fire off and the central heating on then heat would still be escaping through here because it's it's single brick um and can't be insulated because it's it's not a, it doesn't have a cavity and there's a lot of that um it, you know there is a lot of that in the suburbs um this yeah so uh again um that window was closed and so that heat loss there suggests to me that it's not closing properly and that it needs to be adjusted um this is an interesting house these two pictures here this is a 1920s semi-detached um, it's solid brick, um, but interestingly, um, I think that, that it, it's actually solid brick, and therefore the fact that there isn't very much heat loss through this uh, front second bedroom is actually quite interesting. Um, and so, I, but there is heat loss through the um, the window. 
Um, but what's also interesting here is the bay wind is the bay window. So you've got two story bay window, and uh, uh, the the under the glass on the ground floor there will be a dwarf wall which is made of brick, um, and therefore has similar properties to the rest of the brick. But what you've got here is probably timber frame construction. It's certainly not brick, and um, and you can see there's some heat loss through it. I mean, sometimes sometimes you will have, have had insulation put in at some point. Um, but in this case, you can clearly see a lot of heat escaping. Um, but these sec second floor bay windows in particular, in these sort of 1920s, 1930s houses, um, they are not, not only lose heat, but they don't retain heat very well. Um, and so it feels cold. So if you do the um, the infrared thermometer on the inside of the, the the upstairs bay window dwarf wall, then it it will be low. It will be sixteen degrees in the winter, and therefore it feels cold and it's prone to condensation and damp. Um, um, and it it, ca it it can be insulated, but you know you've got to bear in mind that this is um, in, in in many cases this will be the coldest part of and yeah. I often find myself going to houses 1920s, 1930s in the suburbs, um, and and the, the the bay window, upstairs bay window, is the coldest bit, and that bedroom is the coldest room in the house. Um, this is a cat flap. Um, this is a standard UPVC back door. Um, there is, as you can see, there isn't a lot of heat loss through the plastic. There's a bit more through that pane there. This is brick. The, that is, I think at that point, there is uh, some kind of break in the brickwork. And so it, it, it's prob not only is there a thermal bridge between the door frame and the uh, wall, but I've, I've got a feeling that because, yeah, because this is a modern extension in the 1970s, somebody decided to knock down the old extension and build this this new extension there which is a, a monstrosity from an energy efficiency point of view and so i think that there is that they've just not sealed it properly there but the interesting thing in here is the cat flap so you can see there is a you can see that there is some heat escaping through the cat flap um and it's not a, an enormous amount of heat it's not particularly disastrous um but it does feel cold you know when i went there it felt cold around the back door and if you put your hand on the cat flap it feels cold and therefore when we talk about cold air infiltration the cat flap is an opportunity for warm air to escape and cold air to come in um again this is um a chimney on the side of a house this is an older one um and again you can see heat loss through the side of the chimney but also heat loss where the chimney meets the the wall um and there where the the roof meets the wall um this is okay uh right first thing you can see about this is those spots are rain um and so this is why i say you shouldn't really use a thermal imaging camera uh when it's raining and on this it, on this particular night it was literally drizzling it, well it wasn't even drizzling it was spitting with rain, it was the occasional drop, but it's still enough to for the the, the rain to show on the on the lens. Um, so this is a um, eighteen nineties um, mid terrace uh, in in Birmingham. Um, um, you know, Mohammed. It's in an area where where you've probably got a lot of of stock um and um very typical birmingham house um and you can see a lot of heat loss through the um through the walls um interestingly what you can see here is a bay window um and obviously you can see some heat loss through the windows but interestingly there isn't that much heat loss through the roof of the bay window um which suggests to me that the bay window has been insulated at some stage, possibly during the 19... So in, in, in areas like this in Birmingham in the 1980s, there were urban renew, renewal schemes led by, you know, when Edwina Curry was the cabinet member for housing in Birmingham. And, you know, Edwina Curry went on to be famous for other things, but Edwina Curry did get a lot done uh, uh, um, as, 
in terms of urban renewal and part of that is is uh, replacing um the roofs of bay windows with with better insulated models um now this house has got some loft insulation um interestingly now the, the chimney is very interesting here i mean this house on the left that uh, you know there is less heat loss through the walls which might mean that they uh, have some insulation or that they haven't turned the heating up very high but there is still heat loss through the window but the chimney is interesting here because you can see that says you know that says to me that the heat loss through the chimney is coming through this house um and given that there is hardly any heat loss through the windows that suggests to me that this house has got a gas fire on but no central heating um and it's somebody living in one room but that's speculation um now this is an interesting one this is this is two uh semi-detached houses um they were built in the 1920s you can see that you can see that a car has just arrived and you can see the neighbors having a nice chat um over the front fence um <laughs> uh, but in this house very little heat loss through the roof um not that much through the walls but i this is a house that doesn't have the heating on very high. They have the thermostat on 16 or 15, and it was a cold night. Um, whereas this house here, um, the, I was reliably told that they have the heating on full blast, and you can see some heat escaping through the gable end there. Um, this house on the right, this is very interesting because... Um, this this was taken in late winter, um, and the heating hadn't been on very much during the day, but you've still got some heat escaping. So the house, is, the building has absorbed heat from the sun during the day, and he's now losing it. Hence, it looks. Hence, the the temperature is you know is is nine point six. Uh, on the outside walls but this area is, is interesting because um this area is the same construction it's cavity cavity with insulation as built but this bit here has got some external tiles on it as cladding um and in theory tiles do not add to the insulating properties of a house um but what i think but I think that, and I'd welcome anybody else's view on this because it's the same heating regime in this bit of the building. I think what's happening there is that the, is that the brickwork is retaining more heat in that bit of the house because of the tiles than it is in this bit of the house with uh, without tiles. Um, so that's quite an interesting one. Um, I mean, you shouldn't rely on tiles to improve the insulation of a building, um, but um, it, 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 in this instance, it does seem to be having an impact. Um, I think we've seen that one before. This is interesting. Um, this is a condensate pipe. So you've it, this is the kitchen of the house. Um, you've got a condensing gas boiler here. And a condensing gas boiler has a condensate pipe. Um, and as you can see, the condensate pipe is in form. Does any anybody like to hazard a, an explanation as to why it's warm? I think right. Okay, so um, um, so a condensate pipe. So a condensing boiler works by extracting heat from the flue gases, um, and it, it expels the condensate through the condensate pipe. Now, if all of the heat escaping from the flue gases is retained by the boiler, then this should be relatively cool. That is the reason why condensate pipes sometimes freeze in winter, 
because the water coming out the, the the water coming out of the condensate pipe is cool and therefore is prone to freezing. That is why you should insulate a condensate pipe to stop it from freezing because the water coming out of it is cool. In this instance, they haven't insulated the condensate pipe, which is a bit naughty and I advise them that they should insulate it. But interestingly, the water coming out is quite warm. Um, and yeah, Richard, the boiler is on and he's producing steam condensation waste. Ab absolutely right. Um, Richard, do you think that boiler is running in condensing mode? Yes or no? No, yeah. That, thank you, Richard, because that's, that's what I said to the householder. Um, and so because the boiler is not running in condensing mode because it is turned up too high to a temperature of 60 or 70 degrees, uh, and therefore it's not running in condensing mode. The, 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 um, the condensate uh, waste is quite warm um, and therefore the boiler is wasting energy. And so I, I advise them to, um, to run the boiler, the, 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 temperature, the um, boiler temperature to the um, radiators uh, at a lower temperature. Um, and I know for a fact that the gentleman's dad um, phoned him up and told him the same. Um, it gave him a good ticking off for for not running his boiler in in um, in, uh, in condensing mode. But I, I I would say that about half of the half of the combination boilers that I see are not running in condensing mode because the temperatures turned up too high. And this is a quick win that anybody with a condensing boiler and the right controls can do. Um, but this is a very interesting piece of evidence. Deborah, thank you for your comment about energy systems catapults. Um, I would, yeah, if if you've got any information on um, non-traditional um, uh, 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 properties um, and the performance of insulation, but also moisture control, um, that would be very welcome. And I think a lot of people would benefit from that. Um, so the picture on the right, um, so again, you, the, the client had just come home and therefore the engine is still hot on the car. Um, this is the client's house. Um, and yeah, you can see some heat loss. Again, it looks as if there is some insulation in the roof of the uh, bay window. Um, the door isn't too bad, uh, but the single glazed uh, pane above the front door is obviously giving off a lot of heat. Um, in, but what you will notice is that the house next door is, is leaking quite a lot of heat through the wall, through the dormer window, uh, through the front door. And again, you know, when when my client who lives at this house saw that, he was not surprised because he said she does have the heating on full whack the whole time. Whereas this house, uh, they're reasonably, thrift, reasonably thrifty. Have I skipped on? No. Okay, right. So um, again, you've got a car that's just arrived and um, the, the somebody's just got out of it. Um, this is interesting. This is um, a cooker hood. Um, so at the time I did this, um, there, there, there was somebody cooking in the kitchen uh, they have a cooker hood to extract the odors and, um, and and to ventilate. And here you can see it's red because, you know, the heat, heat rising from the cooker is coming out through the cooker hood um, along with everything else. But what you can, interestingly, you can see quite a lot of heat around the edges of it. And again, you, that is possibly cold air infiltration um, what, where the seal isn't particularly tight between the... Um, um, the, the vent and the wall and therefore heat is escaping through the wall and that means that if the, the cooker hood is off then the possibility of cold air getting in into the, the kitchen through that seal. Um, these are, Now these are French doors. Um, a lot of people have French doors because they look very nice and they let a lot of light in and you can see the garden. Um, but wall uh, floor to ceiling glazing is often problematical um so yeah i mean in this one you can see a lot of heat loss and um 
this is one taken from the inside where there is le less heat loss. Uh, this is one from the, the outside where there is, he, there is not heat loss through the panes, but again, uh, through the frames, which uh, were plastic. Um, so you, you will often find in French, where there are French doors, that they form a cold spot, um, especially if they're facing north. Um, and again, if you do this with the, um, the infrared thermometer, on the inter interior of um, French windows, French doors, um, you will find cold spots, particularly, particularly at, the, at the sill at the bottom. This one isn't so bad. Um, this is from the inside. Um, but um, yeah, you can see there are various weaknesses in French windows, uh, which lead to heat loss and, and potentially then being the coldest, coldest bit of the, of the room. Um, if anybody wants to see a good example of French doors, then I suggest you visit um, Northfield Eco Centre, because although, I mean, those French doors date, date from 2008, um, the, um, the construction of them is actually very good. And, and this comes back to what I was saying about design of windows and doors. It's, it's, it's not just a window, it's a system. Um, and whoever designed... Well, I mean, Harriet Martin was the brains behind that. Uh, Bourneville architects were the architect, but whoever designed that French window there has, has done a really good job because there's no heat loss through it whatsoever. Um, and, and so again, as in windows, with French windows and doors, there is a right way and a wrong way to design a window. And thermal imaging tells us a lot. Um, this is a front bay window again. So you can, yeah. Um, this is a front door. Um, I think it's mine. I think this is my house. No, it's not. No, it's not because there's that light there. But, so it's not my house, but it is a house that look and a door that looks a bit like mine. Um, and you, yeah, you can see where the heat is escaping there. Um, I think we've seen that one. Um, now, what we're going to see here is is ventilation. So. Um, this is a house that has a cellar or at least a crawl space under the floor so it has a suspended timber floor um, it has a space under there and there is this is a ventilation grill that is under the floor level so the floorboards are approximately there would anybody like to hazard a guess as to what is happening there what is happening here in terms of the bricks and the ventilation grill. That is a plant pot, so just ignore it. Heat loss from the floor, yeah. Um, thanks, Chris. So yes, so what is happening is that heat is escaping downwards through the floor. So this is the living room. The living room is warm, the heating is on. Most people know that heat rises and it does, but hot, warm air molecules are like the queen on a chessboard. They can move anywhere they like and as far as they like. They've got three heat transfer methods, conduction, convection, and radiation. They can, they can do that in any direction. And so they do escape downwards. That's why it's important to insulate floors when you can. And so the heat molecules are escaping downwards through the uninsulated floor, but also under the floor, you've got that uninsulated pipe work that I spoke about. And, and what that means is that if you go down to that crawl space or cellar, it will actually be quite warm. Um, and so you put in heat somewhere where you don't need it. Hence, these bricks are glowing because there is heat escaping through those bricks. Um, the air brick is actually warmer, is actually cooler, which means that heat is not escaping through the air brick when this photo was taken. Yeah. Does anybody know why? My theory is that it's to do with differential air pressure. Um, 
and so there is a difference in blocked blocked or warmer outside than inside deborah thanks for that i warmer outside than inside um it um it could be but i think it's to do with air pressure it this this grill wasn't blocked because i did inspect it and i could see through the other side um but yes but blocking an air vent might have this effect as well in this instance because it's not blocked i think it's to do with differences in air pressure um and air is going in to the grill rather than out um and over the course of the year as air pressure varies between the inside and the outside then sometimes air will move in sometimes it will move out and as in the Arsene Wenger rule, it will even itself out during the course of the season. Uh, but more on this in a minute. But this this tells me that this tells firstly about underfloor heat loss and two about about ventilation. And if you went back the next day and the air pressure had, situation had changed, then um, then you might get a different result. Um, this is um, interesting. This is a trickle vent. This is taken from the inside, and if you're doing if you're doing thermal imaging from the inside and there is glass involved, you have to be careful because there will be reflection. But what we can see here is um, a trickle vent, and there is quite a lot of heat loss through that trickle vent. This is an interesting one. This is a radiator. This again is inside. This is a radiator and the radiator is giving off heat, which you would expect. But what you can also see is where the pipes come in and out. You can see you can see that the floor is warmer there than the that um, that you can see. You can you can see bits of warm and cold. And again, that reflects the fact that there is an insulated pipe work under the um, um, the floor. Right. Um, this, this is what I mean by messy thermal imaging pictures. So I need to explain what's going on here. This is a wall. This is the floor. This is a refurbished house that has external wall insulation and underfloor insulation. So why is heat escaping there? Does anybody know? Anybody like to hazard an answer? Damp. Um, okay, yeah. If if there was damp, then yes. I mean, a, a thermal image camera d doesn't pick up that, but yes, if there was damp, then it, it, it the, the, there is a correlation with temperature. In this instance, it wasn't damp. Um, what has happened is that is this is what we mean by a, a measures based approach to retrofit this was done five years ago and somebody has specified external wall insulation and somebody has spec specified underfloor insulation well it's not underfloor it's a solid floor they replaced the floor and insulated it but what the, but because they've approached it as two separate measures and not as a whole system, what they've forgotten is where the two building components meet, the floor slab and the wall. And, and it, there is a website called Retrofit Pattern Book, um, which gives you open source um, designs for how to deal with, with common sources of heat loss in a house. And I think that whoever designed this has not followed that, um, and therefore there is there is there is not continuous insulation. Because when we talk about insulation, the golden rule of insulation is, is continuous insulation, um, and they haven't approached this from the point of view of con continuous insulation. They've approached it as 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 two separate measures, and that is one of the problems in retrofit that we have to overcome: is this measures based approach, uh, and uh, one of the reasons why. Past 2035, which is the new standard for retrofit, was developed is is to encourage people to do uh, to to look at 
a house as a whole and not just a series of, of components. Um, okay, um, so um, this is a cellar. This is, a, this is actually a former stately home that is now a retreat house. It's not in Birmingham. Uh, but what you can see here is, um, so this is actually earth sheltered. So the other side of this wall, obviously this cellar is unheated. What's on the other side of this wall is earth. Um, and, um, and what you've got there is ventilation. Um, and what you've got here is heat coming from through the floor from the, 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 I think it was a library. I think on top of this was a library and heat is escaping. And even though you've got this vaulted ceiling, which is made of brick, heat is still escaping. And there you've got a fluorescent light, which obviously is giving off a lot of heat. Now, this one is a really good example of um, what happens in an uninsulated suspended timber floor. So this is a typical Midlands terraced house, 1890s. It's got a cellar. Uh, I was able to go down in the cellar and stand up. Um, some of them will have a crawl space and I'm, you know, I'm scared of crawl spaces, but I don't mind going down in the cellar. And so what you can see here is the floor, underside of the floorboards and heat escaping from the underside of the floorboards. What you can also see is this pipework. And this is pipework that's going from the central heating system to a radiator in the living room. Um, and you can see there where the pipe goes through the floor to the radiator. And you can see the amount of heat that is being lost. And that is typical of homes with suspended timber floors. Um, and, um, and so the solution is to, is to insulate under the floorboards and while you're down there to, to lag the pipe work. But that is enormously common. There are probably hundreds of thousands of homes in Birmingham that have got this. Um, this is another um, ventilation one. Um, and so you can see a wall, which actually looks like a cavity wall. Um, and you can see two air bricks. And one of them is, that one might be blocked, might not it? So yeah, was it Deborah said it might be blocked? The fact that there is heat. So heat is escaping from this one. Um, and so there, there is definitely heat in the cellar, either escaping through the floor or from pipe work. And, um, and, and the differential in air pressure on this occasion is enabling the heat to escape to the outside. The fact that no heat is coming in and out of this one and it's the same color suggests to me that it's not working and it might be blocked. Okay, we're coming to the end of the images now. Um, so this is more suspended timber floor. So it, here, this is from the cellar. That's the underside of the floorboards. That's the underside of the floorboards and that's the hot water pipe work. Um, this is the same house. Again, the floor uninsulated underside of the floorboards from the cellar, hot water pipe work going to a radiator. Um, this is the same. Yep, yeah, this is the same cellar. So you can see the pipe work there. This is this is a house with um, modern underfloor heating in the kitchen. So they've just had a kitchen refurbishment, um, and they put in underfloor heating and. Um, you can see um, uh, you can see the underfloor heating is working and it's low temperature um, and it, it's a fantastic system, um, but it's just disruptive to install. Um, you'll notice that it's, it stops shy of the external wall and window. Um, and um, if you put in an underfloor heating in a kitchen, then you must not put underfloor heating under where the fridge is going to go because it will warm the fridge up. And, and it's also arguable that you shouldn't put it under cupboards where food is going to be stored because the, it will warm the food up and it will go off. Um, now, this is a really interesting one. This is an air brick. And, and I mean, I, put, I actually put my hand over this grill and heat is coming out of one side, but not the other. 
Um, and, and that suggests that the balance between air pressure inside and outside is quite f finely poised. Um, and the air can't make it up its mind whether to go in or out. Um, and, and interestingly, I mean, I haven't got them on this slide, but we took several images of this over a period of two minutes and the boundary between warm and cold kept changing. Um, and that proves that the air movement, the movement of warm and cold air in and out of a ventilation grill is a dynamic thing. Um, it was quite, quite artistic. Um, I wish I'd got the other photos. Um, now, we've seen this, it's a bay window. Now, this is interesting. This is, um, this is not a house, it's, a, it's actually a place of worship. Some of you might recognise it. But this is a, 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 a mid-19th century building. It used to be a, a factory. Uh, appalling energy efficiency, as you can imagine. Um, but in this instance, when I took this, the, the top floor, the heating was turned on was turned off, but the heating was off on, on the ground floor and the first floor. But you can see that, that there is heat escaping through these windows, but not through these. Um, and that's to do with the thermal properties of the windows. Um, now this is an interesting one. This is, again, is a non-domestic building. And what you've got here is, uh, you can see ceiling tiles. So this is the ceiling. Um, this building has a warm air system. And so it has a gas boiler uh, that rather than producing hot water to go to radiators, it produces warm air, which goes through ducts to these registers in the ceiling. That's the registers there, that's, that's one. Um, what do you think is happening in this picture? Split in the duct in, yeah. Um, now, uh, yeah, I mean, what I do know is that a few years ago, insulation was put um, above this, um, these ceiling tiles, but these images suggest that the insulation is incomplete. It also tells us that heat is escaping from the duct in. Um, um, either because it's uninsulated or, as Richard said, it might be split. Uh, but that is a badly performing heating system. Hardly any of the heat is getting to where it, it needs to be. Um, yeah, that's the same building. OK, um, quickly. Um, if you've got a FLIR camera, then you will you will probably need FLIR software. Um, I mean, FLIR software is free, so you might as well use it. Um, this is the application. If you, so if you go on the FLIR website, you will get um, a link to... They don't do it for Macs anymore. They only do it for Windows. Um, and here you can see a very, very pretty thermal image. Um, but I have to say that the desktop version of the software isn't very good. Um, and so I, I use the phone one because the images are on your phone from the camera. So this is the, the app that you need to download for either Android or iPhone, FLIR one. Um, and that does everything you need. And I think it's better than the desktop one. So I use it. People who people who are really geeky about image manipulation software might prefer some other system and, you know, good luck to them. But if, if you're not doing thermal imaging 24 seven, if it's not, you know, 35 hour a week, then, then I think this is perfectly adequate. Right, at this point, I'm gonna show you a couple of quick videos of what happens when you, um, when you uh, use the software. Um, while that is loading, are there any, any questions? We are 
um, close to half past eight, so I've gone on for longer than I should have. But um, so, if anybody's got any questions at this stage, then either shout out or pop them in the chats. Okay. Um, so, what I'm about to show you is a video of how to use the software on a phone. Um, I'm going to try and maximize it. Okay, just about to share now. So uh, yeah, this is a screenshot from my phone. So uh, what happens is that I open the FLIR app on my phone and it's it prompting me to put the camera into the phone, but I don't need to do that because I'm looking at photos that I've already done. So it's going too fast. So I'm going to wind it back a bit. Yeah. So I'll click on gallery. These are some photos that I took earlier and are now on my phone. I've clicked on a photo that I want to use. It now brings up a menu and if I click on that and then on IR scale, it adds an infrared scale to the picture. Now, there's a number of ways you can save the image, but my preferred way is just to do a screenshot of it um, and save it to the phone. And that's, that's the simple way to do it. So I'm gonna show that again. So click on the FLIR app. I don't need to put the camera in because the images are already on the phone or in the cloud. I'm clicking on gallery. I'm clicking on the photo that I want to use, which is the one in the top left. There's the photo now. And if I click in the, on the pencil in the right hand, top right hand corner, it brings up a menu. Click on the three dots and then click on IR scale, infrared scale, and it puts an infrared scale onto the picture. And all I do then is I bring up my uh, phone screen sharing thing and I screen share it and save it. Any questions? I'm now gonna show you a slightly longer version of that where I'm gonna do some more stuff. Um, bear with me. So in this version, what I'm going to do is more or less the same thing, but I'm going to play with color palettes. Um, I mean, I've never been bothered about color palettes on thermal imaging because it's a bit too Snapchat for me. But recently I have started using different color palettes and I actually quite like them. And so I think next winter when we start thermal imaging again, um, I think I will start to use some of the filters. Uh, in this video, I'm also going to show you how to save the, the thermal images to Google Photos, which I think is the best way to save them if you're doing modest numbers. I, I, I've also used Dropbox to save them, but I think Google Photos works better. Um, it, it's easier. 
Okay, so uh, just loading the video now. Just sharing, screen sharing the video. Let's start from the beginning. So same again, I'm in my phone, I'm clicking on the FLIR app. It's inviting me to put the camera in which I don't need to do because the photos are already on the cloud. Click on gallery. I'm going to click on the same photo. Open the photo, click on the pencil in the top right hand corner, click on the three dots. And this time I'm going to click on palettes. And it offers me a number of palettes and I'm going to pick rainbow because I quite like rainbow. I, I think this one works quite well. Um, and the other thing you can do with the rainbow palette, because at the moment you can see the brickwork. Yeah, you can, this convert it to a normal photo. So this is what the house actually looks like. But you can, if you, um, you can remove the brickwork. So this actually looks quite arty. It reminds me of, yeah, so you can turn the brickwork on and off using MSX by pressing MSX. Uh, so brickwork on, brickwork off, and it's a matter of taste, but without the brickwork on it reminds me of, of a Matisse painting so I quite like it um, and I think that works in terms of showing hot and cold um, and, and 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 if you add the IR scale to it then it, it, it is a rainbow rather than red and red and yellow and blue you can also add a spot to it which I am not particularly a fan of I don't think it's that useful So yeah, that's a sort of quick guide to how to use the thermal imaging software on a phone. Um, and uh, I've got one or two more slides. Um, so, yes, if you're using one of these, an infrared thermometer, then obviously it doesn't, re it, well, it remembers it for a second uh, on the little screen, but you need to record it. And so what I uh, produce is a spreadsheet. And so, um, and so what I do on this is I record the, the temperatures at various parts of the inside of various rooms of the house. Um, so let's look at the bedroom one, for example, I'm recording the external wall temperature, the internal wall temperature, um, and you will notice a difference. Um, I'm recording the ceiling or floor. If it's a ground floor, then you would expect to notice in winter that the floor is colder. Um, I'm measuring the temperature of the window reveal, the cold side, in other words, the side nearest the outside and the, the warm side the side nearest the interior of the house and there will be a differential. Um, I'm measuring the loft hatch and I'm doing this in various parts of the house. And if you're on site, you print this spreadsheet off. Um, and that's it. Um, and that's how to contact me if you need to contact me. 
we've gone over time so th but most of you are still here so thank you and um i know there's been a number of um questions during the um the webinar but are there any other questions that people have now No. Well, OK, in that case, we're, we're only a few minutes over. Uh, so thank you all for attending. Um, the recording will be available. I hope you found it useful um, and uh, you'll be able to do something with it. Um, and, you know, hopefully catch up with you with with as many of you as possible again in the near future. Um, there are still some um, Community Energy Fortnight events happening. So if you check out the Community Energy, Energy England website, you'll be able to sign up to those. Um, so thank you all and enjoy the rest of your evening.